Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here. I had a long drive over from Yakima and drove right past where Seattle Falls used to be. And I thought back a little bit about how my parents used to live there. We would all load up into a big old truck. My dad had a two-ton truck. And we would load up uh, our pots and pans and stoves and beds and everything, including our dogs. And we'd move over there in about uh, July. And we would stay there until uh, the fishing season completed. And that would uh, quite often be as late as October. And it, it is what prompted some of the very first uh, fights between the tribal people and the white people because we were told we had to be in school. And we were over there at Silo, this place there, uh, where my father, my br older brothers, my uncles were all catching <coughs> fish. And for us younger ones, our job was to take the uh, salmon, put them in gunny sacks, and walk about maybe about a mile to where my mom and my grandma, my sisters and aunts had all of their uh, drying sheds. And these drying sheds were built, uh, they were built out of old lumber and we would have to gather all of the driftwood along the river so they could use that for smoking, smoke drying. And depending on which species would come by there, some of it was used for uh, salting and uh, usually those were the very large uh, summer chinook. And they, they would be running kind of late, and they would be huge. Uh, they would be 45, 60, once in a while, get an 80 pound uh, summer chinook, call them the June hogs in there. Uh, but all the way down through uh, the uh, fall chinook and the coho and the sockeye. And every one of these fish had their own uh, particular uh, trait quality about them. They had a medicinal quality about them. Uh, of course, this was uh, long before we had environmental pollution. Uh, contrast that with the uh, food consumption survey that the Environmental Protection Agency completed after about five years of observation and data gathering. And they found that uh, so many carcinogens existed uh, in these salmon rooms today that uh, a lot of tribal children were being born with cleft palate. We had a, a very high rate of uh, cancer and uh, children were being born uh, malformed. And uh, back then it wasn't like that. All of these fish could be relied upon for their medicinal powers and not only their nutrition and food substance, but it was also a, a huge economic uh, wealth to our people. And you can imagine the, uh, the largest tribal nation was called the Palouse Pump. And in this area here, Palouse is a tribal word. It means where a, uh, where a man has a right to uh, dip his net. That's the meaning of Palouse. A Palouse Pump are the people who have a right to dip their net into these waters. And that uh, was from the beginning of time. Now, what we often thought through those who were our drummers and dreamers, as they were called, was that the white people would come and do whatever they damn well pleased anyway. We were going to experience that loss. It was going to happen. And as you read about it in history, it's glorified. They have a fancy name called Manifest Destiny. And they talk about progress. And they talk about civilizing uh, the Indian people. And they talk about uh, educating us so that we could be like everybody else. Now, tribal people did not want to be a part of this melting pot. We preferred to live as we had for thousands of generations. But that wasn't going to be. And the reason that uh, it can't be restored in a legal sense, because the United States government, the states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, uh, are very crafty about things. They wrote up agreements. They were forced agreements. And uh, we were paid about $3,000 per individual for the government governments to flood this uh, Salila Falls. 
and it created these uh, backwaters and all of our fishing sites. So this, this loose pump no longer exists. We don't have a place where, where we could naturally put our net in, into the river. Now we have to build scaffolds, uh, but we're fighting with the uh, state and the federal government over where we can build scaffolds. Uh, because in their crafty way, they say, well, you never had an ancestral right there. Well, our ancestral rights are all underwater. And they said, besides that, you were paid. You were paid $3,000 per person. And $3,000, my, my dad, my uncles would take that easily in a year, selling their catch uh, to people who would come along and want to buy them. But the important thing was that we had food to last us through the entire cold seasons. Then we had food to trade. And we would often trade with the Shoshone Bannox. We would go as far uh, north and uh, east as the Blackfeet tribes, and even some of the uh, Lakota, Dakota, uh, those people out further in the Great Plains. And we would exchange and barter. Among our own 14 bands and tribes, the Wenatchipum, uh, a little bit north of the town is now called Wenatchee, the Wenatchipum people uh, were very gifted. They had the ability to interpret uh, uh, natural sign. And, and you hear and see on television things about uh, Indians doing rain dances, uh, and they kind of make mockery of it. But the Wenatchipum were people who knew how to do that. And we would trade with them for huckleberries. And in the Kittitas Valley, uh, that word Kittitas, uh, it, it has a very distinct meaning to it as well. In that valley, there were a lot of uh, natural roots that grew. And those roots were used uh, for our heart conditions, our liver ailments, and those kinds of things. So we would exchange these salmon when they were dried, and you can't imagine how much uh, salmon that was. My mom would fill up trunks and boxes and crates and we would go home with our two-ton truck totally loaded down with salmon and all winter long she could trade that for deer meat and elk meat and other people would be uh, farming over in the Yakima Valley and they would be drying camas and they would be drying the Indian potatoes and Indian onions and we would trade for that so we all, it, it created a, uh, a lifestyle and the subsistence that the government didn't care about that. All they wanted was, we're going to pay you $3,000. And that's a lot for you Indian people. You should be glad to get it. But when you look at the language, that's really how it was approached. And when you look around the world, it's, it's not hard to see how that developed. Because when you look at uh, the archives, history of the United States, there were more than 500 treaties signed with Indians. And what was the treaty for? Uh, the, the kindness in your history textbooks, it'll say, oh, because we wanted to end the war with the, the Indian people, we wanted to assimilate them, we wanted to have them improve lifestyles. But of those 500 treaties that were signed, <coughs> only half of them were ever ratified. But in every one of those treaties, there was land cessations. And the US government took the land from the Indians in every single one of those 500 treaties, but they never enacted half of them. And so when we look at the morality here, the United States uh, has a right to be embarrassed about these things, but they don't. In 2010, the United States Congress finally passed a resolution that apologized to the Indian people for atrocities that they committed in their policies and in their acts and in the ruination of things like Celilla Falls. But they had a hard they time to make sure it passed that because it. tribal people did not use it to file a claim for any of these damages. And the tribal people at that time said, we don't care about damages. I mean, but those things, you're not gonna undo any of these things anyway. Uh, but you look at the, not only our tribal people, but you look a little broader around the world, like in Bhopal, India, 
where Union Carbide was responsible for 30,000 deaths there. And you look at what happened. Was there justice that was brought? It's American company making huge profits there. They killed 30,000 of the other Indian people over there. And the maximum penalty that was ever assessed was two years in prison. And those 30,000 people that died had relatives. And even today, uh, the World Resources Institute and others say that the children are still being born malformed, that the cleanup has never been done. Dow Chemical purchased the uh, Union Carbide, but they said they have no obligation to continue any kind of cleanup. So this, this capitalistic point of view, it, it doesn't necessarily clash with uh, this cultural point of view. It just meant to ride roughshod over it. And this is what uh, our tribes have experienced. So these kinds of things that happened and occurred here, uh, there was a, an In Lucites Act that was passed. Uh, and what it did is it gave 26 sites in lieu of what was flooded. And that was supposed to uh, provide for further uh, payment to the tribes. So we have these 26 In Lieu sites, and then they were they were built by uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. And the Army Corps of Engineers do not know how to build a drying shack. So they constructed out of steel, out of aluminum, corrugated uh, aluminum and things like this. They were horrible. They, they did not dry the fish properly. They didn't have the right kind of water that the uh, people needed for the correct salting of the salmon. They, they stocked wood for the, the women, said so we're going to bring all this wood down from the forest for you. But there's a certain wood that they use. It has to have the right content of uh, water and it, to a certain degree, uh, age to a certain degree before it's properly used. If you don't use the proper one, your dried salmon get worms in them. And these are things that uh, we, we just felt like you know, whenever the government tries to manage something in place of uh, tribal <laughs> culture or things that we have learned by observation experience for thousands of generations, it, it can only become uh, further disastrous. Uh, and we, we just feel sometimes like uh, we look at other countries around the world and we think, well, we kind of know what uh, to expect. And we, we see whether it was Bhopal or Love Canal or Chernobyl. All of these things are just horrendous on humanity. And I think this is a, a good reason for having conferences like this to keep alive that sense of morality so we, we don't make so many of these mistakes in the future. Uh, we, we work in conjunction with other tribes and native uh, nations like the First Nations in Canada and some of the uh, Alaskan villages that are, their, their villages are dropping into the ocean. And the, the erosion is, is being caused. The uh, people debate about whether or not uh, climate change is real or not. Well, their villages up there uh, that used to be about a half a mile from the ocean and is now right on the ocean. And they, they filed a claim with the federal government to move their uh, homes, but they said it's going to cost them $95 million and the government doesn't have that. So what are the tribal people to do? Uh, they're just going to have to watch their homes drop into the ocean. Uh, these cliffs are eroding away. So we see that often, and the thing about this is that if tribal people speak about it, uh, they say, well, you guys shouldn't whine so much. Uh, just be quiet and let things uh, occur. But uh, like we had the, uh, the Violence Against Women Act. Who in their right mind would not want to support that kind of a bill? Republican. But the United States <laughs> Congress, uh, <coughs> they vetoed it the first time. They didn't, uh, they didn't pass it. And it barely got passed this last time, but they took out, from, uh, at first, the Indian women. They, they took the, them out of it. And we had to have a major legislative effort to
to get our tribal women included back into it again. So uh, if, if institutions like universities don't try to create this awareness, uh, the people in Washington, D.C. will act without conscience. And this is what uh, happened here. Uh, the, if you look at the real archives, there's, there's minutes. You can read them and what the Army Corps of Engineers promised, what the Bonneville Power Administration promised, and the, the Bureau of Reclamation promised. All of these things they said would res result in 10 times more salmon than the Indians ever thought you could catch at Sea Island. Instead, we went to endangered species, as uh, Vincent was talking about here. We didn't get 10 times more salmon than we used to get. Uh, we were struggling just to keep what very few species there are alive. We're making reintroduction. And this resulted in the, uh, the development of Zone 6. So this covered up Salila Falls is now part of the Zone 6 fishery that was supposed to be a uh, gentleman's agreement. It was supposed to last only until the tribes had the time, the opportunity, and the money to restore the tributary fishing. And that is really, really slow progress. Uh, I was executive director at the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission for 10 years, and, and that, I, that was from 1989 to 1999. And I go back there and uh, consult with them, and in some instances, we're, we're still the same place today that we were back in 1989. It's a glacial pace to try and make these restoration efforts. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't progress, there is, but it's very slow. And so these kinds of things, they, they live on in, in picture. Uh, in, in our tribal culture, they live on in our songs that we sing, in the language that we have. Even the names that uh, we utilize, uh, it still talks about uh, this a very sacred uh, area on this on this earth. But what was made, you know, just a brief story, the Columbia River is it was made out of sorrow. In, in the Yakima language, what they mean is that, that at the very beginning of time, when there were monsters uh, that roamed this world, and there were no humans, and it was the Spilii, the coyote, uh, that gorged out to the entire Columbia River. And he was looking for his family. There's some other monsters from way up in the north came and killed his uh, wife and kidnapped his kids. And he went looking for them. And when he found them, they were all dead. And he came back and partly out of his anger, partly out of his sorrow and anguish, he, he gorged out this entire Columbia River. So our people tell us that, that we have to be very uh, careful. We always have to be respectful. and. Whenever we have a drowning or something like this, these stories come back again. And they say now the uh, governments have added even more of this anguish. And because of these uh, huge uh, dams, uh, some of our, our people die uh, fishing out there trying to use gill nets and instead of our uh, riverbank fishing from natural sites. But I think that's about all that I want to cover today and you know, what, what our time is. Uh, here, but we will have plenty of time to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.